Hey y'all, Data Guy here. And today I threw on my green screen shirt and decided I want to make a video today just kind of breaking down some of the most common data architecture concepts. So we're going to be going through things like modularity, abstraction, encapsulation, layering, uh, and then also even things like brownfield versus greenfield projects, event-driven architecture, uh, single versus multi-tenant tightly versus loosely coupling. Basically just give you a full rundown of all the different architecture terms that you might need to know uh, when you're first getting started in data. Um, so without further ado, let's get into it. Let's start breaking down some terms. Let's start educating uh, and having some fun here. So let's go. So the first term I wanna talk about here is modularity. And modularity involves dividing a software system into distinct self-contained units known as modules. And each module is intended to address a specific set of responsibilities, interact with other modules through well-defined interfaces. This separation of concerns allows developers to work on those individual components without affecting the others, making the code base easier to understand and maintain, as well as promoting flexibility because it enables the replacement or modification of one module without impacting the entire system. Additionally, modular systems often lead to higher code reuse since individual modules can be repurposed for different applications and built on top of. So it's a really great system to use when you're building lots of different components that all need to fit together. And you can see kind of an example of this um, broken down where you have microservices, mini services, macro services, all the way up to functions. And you can see how you divide the responsibilities even more and more as you go down the modular path all the way to uh, microservices. Now, the next term I want to talk about is the concept of system abstraction. So I kind of have this fuzzy example up on the screen here, and I'll more talk about the example because it is an abstract term. Um, and that's because what abstraction means is you simplify the design of, high, of complex systems by hiding all the intricate implementation details and providing really just a simple high-level interface. An example of this would be, let's say you have a machine learning team that wants to enable Data, science, data analysts, low, really anyone, to run machine learning models. Instead of trying to enable all those people to know how to run and build their own models, what they could do is build a form system where they enter their data they want to perform a machine learning model on, then put in a model that they want to run, and then the intricate details behind the scene, you know, maybe there's a data pipeline, takes that data, processes it, does some vectorizing, then feeds it into the model, all that is abstracted away from the end user. This is really crucial because it enables developers to focus on just the essential functionalities rather than being designed by low level details or really needing to worry about enabling every single end user of it. By creating those layers of abstraction, you can separate the system's core logic from its implementation specifics, which then also leads to more robust and adaptable design because you can tweak things on the back end without ever really needing to expose it to the front end. And it also reduces the cognitive load on developers because they only need to understand that abstracted interface, which allows for more straightforward modification and testing of those components as well. Now, the next term I want to talk about with this nice 1980 style graphic is encapsulation. Now, encapsulation is a principle that safeguards the internal workings of a particular module by limiting access to its data and behavior through well-defined interfaces. And you can see this here where we have a class that has two sets of variables and methods that are private instance variables and private methods that are inaccessible to outside code, but then also a set of public instance variables and public methods that define access to the internal state of that particular module. So encapsulation will help prevent unintended interference from external components like outside code. And this boundary allows the module to enforce its invariance, ensuring data to integrity and also reducing the potential for errors. Um, and then also, this will make modules much easier to refactor and extend down the line since external code relies only on that stable external interface, while you can still change the internal implementation of how that external uh, interface triggers certain actions or interacts with the core of the module. Um, so it makes code both more secure and more maintainable. Now, the next term I'd like to talk about is separation of concerns. So the separation of concerns, and you can see an ex example up on the screen here, is where you divide software into very distinct sessions with a eye on atomicity, where each aspect of the software addresses a specific aspect of the overall system rather than layering them all in and within the same operation. This type of segregation minimizes the overlap of responsibilities, which makes each section's purpose clear and also reduces the likelihood of introducing bugs during development. 
Additionally, if you bring in a bug, the blast radius of that bug is much smaller. Now, by isolating functionalities, testing also becomes more straightforward because individual concerns can be verified independently rather than needing to test the entire system as a whole. And clear delineation of concerns also makes it easier for different teams to work on separate aspects of the system simultaneously without unnecessary conflicts or a duplication of work. So really great tool in uh, software development. Now, the next, con next concept I want to talk about is layering. Now, layering is an architectural strategy that organizes your different components of your different systems into distinct levels, each represents, representing a particular set of functionalities. For instance, in this example, we have the various you know, customer-facing layers of social media tools that then filter down into recommendation engines, that then filter down into customer services processes and systems, R&D, analyzing the actual data produced by these, this first layer to identify, hey, how do we differentiate and create a new uh, system? Then all the way down to just systems of record, backend databases that are just tracking suppliers, orders, products, um, and just wanted to have this kind of simple example to illustrate the concept that having all your layers into different sets of, you know, cover different sets of responsibilities like presentation, business logic, data management, you can group similar concerns together <clears throat> and then have each layer interact with the adjacent layers through well-defined interfaces, which then enables a clear flow of information. This controlled interaction ensures that each layer remains focused on its responsibilities and then can be modified or replaced as needed uh, to without affecting unneeded others. This also, similarly to the previous uh, separation of concerns term, simplifies debugging and testing because it provides a logical separation that can be traced to the stack, leading to better overall system stability. So great tool for organizing the different layers of software that comprise your business. Now, the next concept I want to explore is tight versus loose coupling in systems. So coupling itself refers to the degree of interdependency between different components. And tight coupling involves high interdependency between components, making it difficult to replace or modify one without impacting all the others that depend on it. Traditional monolithic applications often exhibit tight coupling due to shared data and logic, and there is a place for it in some cases, but in most instances, it's just going to reduce unnecessary brittleness into your architecture. Now, loose coupling minimizes dependencies between components, which fosters flexibility and also easier maintenance. Multi-tier architecture and microservice architectures are examples of loosely coupled designs. Then you also have within this kind of realm is our tiers, and tiers represent logical groupings of functionalities. So when you saw the multi-tier architecture earlier, separating presentation, application, logic, data management into distinct layers, that's an example of loosely coupling. Monoliths, on the other hand, consolidate all system functionalities into a single deployment unit. And while this is easier to develop initially, monoliths suffer from scalability and flexibility issues as systems grow. Then finally, you also have microservices, which break down monoliths into independently deployable modular services where each service addresses specific business functionalities and interacts with each other uh, with others through APIs, which promotes scalability, resiliency, and also a accelerated development because everyone can work on their own components independently. Now, the next term is a cool one that I just learned while researching this video, which is brownfield versus greenfield projects. Um, and this is actually important when you're starting a software project, uh, it can help you understand the context. So brownfield projects involve modifying or improving existing systems, and these require really careful planning because you gotta integrate new features without breaking any current functionalities. So think about things like le legacy dependencies, lift and shift applications, technical debt that you're trying to resolve, tight coupling um, of components that might complicate development, versus greenfield projects are starting with a completely blank slate which enables developers to just implement the latest, coolest, greatest architectural practices, newest software, and offers a lot of freedom, but also demands a robust foundation and a kind of a plan going into it to ensure scalability, reliability, and also, above all, maintainability. Now, the final topic I want to quickly cover is event-driven architecture. Um, and event-driven architecture really emphasizes communication between components through asynchronous events, moving off of time-based scheduling like batch jobs, and really having everything happen just in time. So when a data set is produced, then it's consumed by the various subsystems that need to consume it. And then when that data set is updated and there's a new one consumed, that whole process starts over again, rather than saying, hey, every time at 12 o'clock each day, this process is going to run. Um, and so within this kind of architecture, there's a couple key terms. Uh, event producers generate events when changes occur, which 
often represents a significant state transition, something that data set changing, really any kind of change. Then you have event consumers, which subscribe to these events and execute appropriate actions in response, which then go into event brokers, which mediate the relationship between producers and consumers and ensure reliable message delivery. And this is things like Apache Kafka, RabbitMQ. And some of the benefits of this design include loose coupling, scalability, resilience, and just allowing systems to adapt to fluctuate, fluctuating workloads uh, where you might not, where time-based scheduling is saying, hey, this happens every once every day, might not work because you just have a high variation of when that data is produced or when it's updated. Um, and so that is the last term I kind of wanted to leave you with today. I hope you learned something from this video around just some various architectural terms and concepts. Uh, it's kind of building off my previous architectural principles video. Uh, but yeah, let me know what I didn't cover or what you want to see in a future video and have a great rest of your day. Data guy out.